Hello, welcome everyone. We're going to get started in about a minute, just to make sure we get everybody in, and then we'll we'll dive right in. I'm really glad you're here today. All right, 101. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. And <clears throat> Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Mark Weber. I'm a consultant with Floors Marsh and the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, I am honored and thrilled to say Head Start was part of my portfolio, as well as the Refugee Resettlement Program. So uh, it's really great to be re-engaging with the community. Um, but before we jump into today's presentation, I just want to share a little bit of background about you know how we got here today, and and this project started a little less than a year ago, in September of 2023, as a it's a collaboration between the National Head Start Association and Fours Marsh, which is a company of researchers, advisors, and communicators, and we established two main goals for the project. First to enroll more children from families with refugee status in Head Start programs, and two, to employ more people with refugee status in Head Start programs. To get started, we conducted a series of informational interviews with Head Start programs and refugee resettlement agencies across the country. And, and we listened to them, what the barriers were, what, what were some of the ideas they had for for helping achieve these goals and some of their, their own experiences with, with barriers and accomplishments. And as a result, uh, the National Head Start Association of Forest Marsh created two, two toolkits of communications materials to help refugee resettlement agencies learn about and enroll more children from families with refugee status in Head Start programs and to Head Start programs to employ more people with refugee status. So, so bringing two communities together based on what they observed were the needs. Um, the insight provided by the Head Start programs and refugee resettlement agencies were instrumental in developing these toolkits. We're gonna talk just a little bit more about the toolkits in a second, but we're gonna start out with some housekeeping per usual. And before I inter introduce our panelists, I wanted to share some basic housekeeping items for you to keep in mind. If you have questions during the panel, please write them in the chat. If your question is for a specific panelist, please mention that. Uh, we'll have time at the end for audience Q&A. You can measure my effectiveness by making sure we have time at the end. And we definitely want to capture all your questions. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent out to those who registered. We're also going to post the link of the webinar to the National Head Start Association website that can be found in the resource library under recordings. And we will be sharing the links to the two, two toolkits that I mentioned earlier. Please take, it, take an opportunity to look at these toolkits, use them. We created them to facilitate connections between the Head Start and refugee resettlement communities and tell others who might be interested about them. And, and finally, the toolkits were also located on the National Head Start Association website under the hub. This, this really did, this whole project initiated as a, a workforce program, a, a strategic way to target individuals that are very favorable to working in Head Start programs. And if you missed it, uh, we did do a webinar last month where we highlighted the content of the two, two toolkits. Uh, so... The, the link is in the, uh, the chat, and again, you can find it on the Head Start website, the National Head Start Association website. All right, housekeeping done. Today, we are presenting a panel of individuals from organizations who are excelling in supporting both children, adults, and employees with refugee status. Our goals by the end of this webinar are to raise awareness about the communications toolkits. I'm trying to do a good job of that there. 
And again, these were developed to facilitate the connection between local Head Start programs and refugee resettlement agencies. And two, provide the opportunity to hear from Head Start programs and refugee resettlement leaders who are successfully engaging with families that have refugee status and are from refugee communities. Now, I would like each of our panelists to introduce themselves, share their name, their organization, their, and then their service delivery, delivery area, and just a, a little bit about themselves, what, what, what their passion is about working with refugee community or with Head Start programs. And I, I will call each of them by name, and then we, we'll start with, with Hilda Morales. Hilda. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gilda Morales Aleman. I, I have been working, first of all, I am an administrative director for ERSI, um, Family Services and Data um, Systems here at Carter McCloskey Community Services, the Early Childhood Division um, located in the South Bronx. We deliver services to more than a thousand children covering the South Bronx. I have been in the Head Start world for 23 years, um, educator. Um, I taught in the same school I went as an elementary school, and then I went into the Head Start family. My passion um, for working with immig immigrant and refugee families uh, was that I was uh, that refugee child um, many, many years ago. And um, the delivery of service is always to help out and letting those children achieve more for a dream that they come to this country. So that is my passion. And I've been delivering the services through our family services engagement piece here at Cardinal McCloskey. Thank you. All right, thank you, Gilda. Um, Dr. Thea Wilson, please. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Thea, Dr. Thea Wilson. I'm from uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, my program is Step Forward. We service uh, approximately 1,700 children in the area of actually the county, Cuyahoga County is our area. And uh, my passion is, um, I think my, my greatest passion is just the, the children who are coming from um, the refugee families and making sure that they uh, get what they need to uh, make them a great citizen of the United States. I've seen it work. Uh, over and over again. And uh, that's my passion, just to see that it works for them. All right, thank you. Uh, Jennifer Larson. Hi, I'm Jennifer Larson. Um, I'm in Southeastern Minnesota, uh, Rochester, um, the town of Rochester. And my, uh, my um, program is Family First of Minnesota. And I'm the Associate Head Start Director here. And we just have a really diverse population um, being in the area that we And I guess my passion comes from um, my background uh, in education and coaching um, and as a former Head Start myself. And so I, I've been in, in the shoes of the Head Start. So, so Jennifer, if you could be a little closer to your microphone when you're speaking. Or, Sorry. Or, you know, I don't want to miss a word of wisdom here, but but there we go. That sounds like much better. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, better. Yes. So I I actually started out as a Head Start parent. So I've, I've come in as a Head Start parent and worked my way up and background in education. And I really enjoy... Um, seeing parents come in and the joy that I see when they're accomplishing things along with their child accomplishing things. So um, I guess that's where my passion is behind this is when we get to bring parents in and have them grow just as much as their children are growing. All right, Jennifer, thank you. And again, if I'm going to try, if you can speak up a little bit and stay closer we're having a little bit of a problem with your microphone and I'm going to try head I'm going to try putting my headphones in and see if that works. All right, that, that, that sounds good. Whatever whatever we need to do works. And then uh, Malathion Arlenosi. Yes. Uh -huh. 
I'm Malad al uh, I'm uh, from Seattle, uh, Arkansas, and I'm working with KME and WA, the Resettlement Agency for Refugee in Northwest Arkansas. And uh, my passion uh, comes from my background as a refugee mom for three kids. Um, so uh, that comes uh, how it's important to support other refugee to be a self-sufficiency and be good citizen here in the United States. All right. Well, thank you very much. Again, thank you all for being here and and we'll we'll keep working on the the audio as as need be. Um I, I feel a little bit like a, the Jeopardy game host here, but our uh, first topic of conversation today is outreach, engagement, and building community partnerships. And and we know, you know, one of the one of the things that kids who are uh who come from refugee communities who are enrolled in Head Start family and Head Start programs, those families tend to integrate more quickly into the community. And, you know, it's no secret to people who work in the community about the, the networks and, and, and how to connect, but, but specifically speaking about refugee communities and connecting with Head Start, um, we want to, we want to have a conversation here a little bit again about those connection strategies and, and, and Gilda is going to lead us off here. Oh, good afternoon. So um, when we first started, uh, one of the things that came into my mind was um, thinking back about my childhood, right? I wish all these resources were out there when my mother migrated here um, with two children, right? Um, and not knowing the language and where have we, be, you know, the school, the networks, and working in the Head Start family, um, I'm in the Bronx right now. I work for the Bronx. I worked in Manhattan and I worked in Harlem. Uh, most, where do these families come from? How do you achieve to enroll refugee families um, and children? What are the resources out there? So the first thing is um, every Head Start has to have a community assessment, right? Uh, we all know that and most programs run it every five years, but every five years seems to be a long time when things change after the pandemic, we all know that a lot of clinics, a lot of health clinics, a lot of schools, a lot of uh, community-based organizations kind of like change staff, right? Um, some of them were closed. Um, therefore, building that community partnership is very important. That has been my goal um, since I started here at um, Cardinal McCloskey. And I think uh, we have enrolled um, a lot of refugees making that community um, engagement piece going to that community partnership, CBO organization, knocking on doors and saying, hey, we are the school right up the block or one point mile away from you. We would like to service your children. Um, can we walk into your shelter? Can we walk into your community-based organization? Can we talk about our schools? Can we deliver the services to you? Uh, so it comes into that into mind. Um, a lot of the families didn't know the language. Um, I'm bilingual, I speak Spanish, but we've had children um, coming from Russia. We've had children speaking a different dialect. Although they came from Mexico, they speak a different dialect that we didn't know, you know, we couldn't communicate with them. So we had to be creative. And one of the ways that creativity brings is partnering with that, uh, with that community agency and finding resources for those families in order to make this successful. Let me tell you that Google Translator has been it. Um, we all are into this new world of cell phones and tablets and computers, right? Having an intake, um, leading our family workers, our family services staff to be creative in, in using these tools to translate material for these families not to feel left. It's not just giving them a sheet of paper and saying, here, get enrolled and come back because that sheet of paper doesn't, it's not meaningful is learning about where they come from, what services do we have to offer? So I think that piece is very important to go out into the community and make community partnerships that are meaningful, that are gonna give quality, not quantity. The quality is the most important thing. I could be able to go to the church, the local church and say, I work with you, what, what services are you going to offer? So here in the South Bronx, we have partnered with churches. We had partner with healthcare providers. 
who are the doctors that are seeing our children? What services are out there, meaning for crisis intervention, food? Um, and also, thankfully, um, building that community itself, um, aside from the community assessment that's done every five years, let's rethink every year and let's, re let's, let's research, you know, every year to find out if it did it work. Did that community um, organization that you partnered was it successful for your agency? So um, I can tell you that being here in this agency for four years, I since I started, it has worked. I can I can go into the clinic and I know the doctor's name and who they service for our children, what kind of services. So legal services, um, health services, um, religious services as well, because they offered sometimes those stops, single stop shops. Um, for our families. Um, so I think the partnering with your, you should be able in your community, that's very important when you're coming in as a refugee parent. I know that um, um, Alarna, Alarna C can, can say that, like she's, you know, coming as a parent um, and feeling that that corner uh, store or that church, she's able to know who they are and what services they're going to be provided. Mark, I can't hear you. You're muted, Mark. Leave it to the host. Thank you. <laughs> so, so Dr. Wilson, what, what's it look like in Cleveland out there? How 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 do you all work and build partnerships uh, with the refugee community? <laughs> and and Dr. Wilson, you are now muted. Wait, sort of like pass the baton to the- Yeah, the okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, in Cleveland, uh, we've uh, approached it a little differently because what we did was, uh, yes, we went into the community and uh, searched out, because we have a strong, uh, a very large Arabic community. So, uh, of course, in Arabic is not a language that you're going to learn overnight. That's for sure. Uh, so, like you said, Google is a is a wonderful tool. However, we've also uh, made it a little bit more uh, human and made it sure that we had uh, people on staff who spoke the language. So we would go into the communities and see who would want to work uh, for yeah. us and uh, would become a translator for the children and for the parents. But in the um, in the onset of it, we had a, uh, we opened up a, a, an entire class uh, essentially for uh, that, for the communities that we were serving. And what we found was the other piece of this is the cultural aspect and understanding the culture that we were going in uh, before mm -hmm. we uh, really started truly inviting them in because there were some nuances that we had to learn um, that we had to adapt, we had to adapt to um, when when we started doing our, our services. Uh, in one instance, we had um, the, in, for example, the Arabic uh, families, the mothers didn't want to leave the children. So we accommodated the, the parents, the, the mothers who wanted to stay. They became volunteers in the classroom. But the, the fact was, you know, so I would go out to the classroom and sometimes we would have six and seven parents in the same classroom, but it was okay. They became a family, they worked with one another and uh, it, it benefited not only our agency to learn something about our community, but it benefited the uh, community itself. So, so Dr. Wilson, sort of moving on to the next topic, recruiting and hiring adults from refugee communities, what were what were some of the specific things that that you used to, you know, welcome and invite refugee individuals with refugee status to apply for jobs at Head Start, and you know, maybe a little bit about the certifications or or how how did you how did you recruit and hire adults from refugee communities? Making sure our um... Uh, our forms were user friendly. If we had to have, we, you know, we've had to translate many of our forms to other languages, uh, making sure that uh, someone could have a, uh, could actually speak to them 
you know, uh, I would not be the one trust and, uh, but you know, a friendly face, someone, uh, I, you know, I look at myself, if I went to a, a, a different, uh, country and tried to get a job, how would I feel? One thing I want someone who looks like me. <laughs> Number two, I want someone who could speak my language to make me feel comfortable and make me feel like I want, like you want me there. Uh, that was the big thing, uh, just about uh, inviting them and being able to uh, communicate. And that's the biggest part of it. If you invite them, make sure that, um, I hope you're inviting them. I hope that you also understand their culture and understand what they're looking for as well. But there were really powerful words there. It's like, how would I feel if mm -hmm. I were in another country after most likely a very traumatic, traumatic experience? Um, and and here you are. Thank. I'm, I'm gonna always remember that. How how would I feel? And that and sometimes I'll add. You know, cultural relevance and competence is very important. But but the that comment to me just says you respect the individual. You know exactly. Treat me. I would treat you. We'll, we'll and it was it interesting. Back. We also have a large Somali uh, refugee uh, group come in uh, some time ago, and we had to discern how old the children were, even because everyone had a January first birthday. So oh. we really had to figure out how old each child was. And I, you know, you really have to pull out all of those wonderful tools in your mind that you learned as a, a, a grad school uh, student. What are the benchmarks for children and how can I assess to make sure this child is getting into the, uh, the right grade um, system? Uh, and we had uh, someone, I'll, I'll give you a big example of, of really understanding the culture and where they're coming from. There were two Somali groups that came into Ohio. One was in Cleveland and one was in Columbus. Somebody had this great idea that we should get the two together, the two groups together. And I said, there's a reason why they might be separated. <laughs> let's let's find out why. <laughs> you know, and thank God we did do that research because I'm not sure which group it was, but one group was warring with the other group in Somalia. So had we gotten them together, 71 would have been not not pretty. Yeah. Well again, thank you. Thank you. And and thank goodness for the innovation at the community level uh and, and asking the right questions that sometimes don't get asked at higher state and federal levels. Uh, Jennifer, I, I know you all have some really great examples in, in Minnesota around recruiting and hiring adults. Uh, you wanna share with us some of your strategies? Can you hear me a little better with the microphone? With Much the better. Headphones? Okay, good. Um, yeah, uh, you know, talking about having uh, a variety of languages, at, you know, at one point, I think we had 10, 11 different languages happening within our centers. And so being able to have, you know, someone who looks like you talks that same language is so important, not only for our kids in our classroom, but for parents as well. And we're, we're constantly looking to see how can we encourage those parents to apply so that they can be part of our staff so that they are here so then they can help the next person um they can be that person that go-to person that can help um those newcomers understand the new space that they're in um because i could just imagine going somewhere where i didn't know the language i didn't know the culture i didn't know how to get where or or what to do um you know sort of a funny story about in Rochester is we have Silver Lake that has a bunch of geese. Um, and we had a teacher that went on a home visit and we had a parent that asked if he could shoot the geese that were out in the Silver Lake because he wanted to feed his family. And, you know, our teacher is like, mm, no, like, you, like, that's something you can't do. That's not legal to do here. But it's, Things like that are just, you 
don't know what you don't know. Um, so we're like, we're constantly committed to looking at where are the gaps in our program around language culture? Where, where can we look then to, to go out and encourage um, parents to apply for positions? And then we were coming across the barrier of Head Start performance standards of we'd have parents apply for positions, but you're not qualified because either you, you know, you're coming in with limited ed education or, you know, your degree that you did have in where you came from didn't transfer to, you know, here. And so what do you do? you're stuck in this. And so um, we had to figure out how we were going to get around that. I was going to say, so what did you do? Because <laughs> I, I know you didn't turn them away. No. So okay. that, yes, we did not turn them away. So we had to figure out what we were going to do around this. And so um, we just, we, you know, we decided this, this, this was our our goal, this is what we were going to look at, how we were going to figure out how we could support them and support our program at the same time. Um, and this actually ended up right around COVID time. So um, COVID was somewhat of a blessing because we ended up getting some extra COVID funding, which sort of helped this out. So um, we decided to start a grow your own, um, a grow your own parent CDA program. And so what we did was we, uh, I, I have a professional development coach who put together this Grow Your Own program, who put out an informational uh, session. She put a flyer out uh, for, to parents to see, are you interested in working for Head Start? Here's benefits for working for Head Start. Here's what a CDA is. Here's what it's all about. Here's the requirements for it. You know, if you're interested, you know, let us know. And we put that out in our, on our website. We put it out on our Facebook. We sent it out in backpacks. We had our home visitors talk to our parents. We had it translated. We had our home visitors verbally translate it because some languages don't translate well. Um, and then we had uh, an actual information session in person where anybody who was interested could come to that session and learn more about it. Um, and from there, those that were interested, we moved forward with that, that program to help support them with obtaining um, a CDA. So and switching a little bit to the next topic, once you get them in the door, you have them qualified, they meet Head Start standards, and and you, uh, based on their own initiative and your support, how do you keep them? I mean, they're like, oh my gosh, I got a job in the United States. I'm like, I'm making some money now. And, and you know, we know there are competitive salaries for great workers. How do you keep them? Well, it. It takes a little while for this whole process. So it wasn't right. just get in the door and you get your right. you yeah. get your CDA. So this is a you know this was a year long process to obtain this CDA. It's which they had support through this entire process from our professional development coach. So it's you know completing the four hundred and eighty hours of classroom time. It's completing the hundred and twenty hours of uh, classroom training which we paid for. It's you, you know it's having mentorship from our classroom teachers to be able to help them learn about early childhood education. It's having support from hopefully other staff who spoke their language. Um, it, and mm -hmm. language again was a barrier. We had um, a staff, uh, a parent, an Arabic speaking parent. And one of the frustrating barriers is the CDA council saying, you know, they're equitable because it was in another language, Spanish. Right. That's it. it. You know, that's, that's not equitable. Like, so I, I had a parent who spoke Arabic 
who we sent through three times to take her CDA test mm -hmm. because the language was the barrier. She couldn't like, she studied and studied and studied, but by the time when she had to go take it in English, that was what tripped her up. Got it. And the only, the, 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 the way the equitable piece they said was that we could provide an interpreter to go with her, but we would have to, we would have to provide a PD specialist who spoke Arabic. Got it. So, so it sounds a lot like, you know, again, I did not intend to minimize com yeah. complexity <laughs> of the process, Sorry. but, but when in, you know, in general, any individual, you know, who forms a connection with an organization feels that support, you know, they, they're going to stick around, you yes. know, because that's not, you know, the connection and the support is a, is a good and big incentive for somebody to stay employed in a particular workplace. Mark, I'm sorry. I, I think also, um, Jennifer, um, I think also it has to do with the volunteering, right? So we have that piece, um, that creativity and Head Start, where you can have those parents um, volunteer in the program. There's a policy council, um, the meetings with the parents, um, where you get them to volunteer. So not only is it you, they, they're starting to trust you. You're starting to learn about them. Um, they feel comfortable leaving their children on our care and then growing. So it's grow your own, right? Um, so I can see that volunteering merging into while they finish their CDA and then you promising them, hey, I'll, you know, we'll still keep your child enrolled in the program um, until you finish your CDA and your child graduates. So is that trust? And then yep. there's also that piece of volunteering. Um, so they feel connection and they want to stay because not only are you trusting them, but your children are also being cared for. So it's it's like a double dipper, I say. And, yeah. And, 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 and part of that piece of once they complete their CDA, part of our program also in, in Minnesota is if you want to continue on past that, you also then could uh, go for your associate's or bachelor's degree and we have teach. So there's also an avenue to go farther and get your associate's or bachelor's degree. And, awesome. it, you know, 85% is paid by teach, 5% by us. And it's, it's an unbelievable uh, uh, opportunity. And, and again, Gilda is like the win, 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 you know, it's like once Triple you win. that, that upward spiral of supporting and strength and, 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 uh, um, individuals who are now, you know, contributing yeah. members of society. And, and not only, it does, not only does it stop there, Mark, um, and you know, you build goals with these families as they come in. So their goal, sometimes they come in and they say, oh, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. Okay. That's great. But let's talk about short-term goals. Let's talk about achieving goals. These are goals that are short-term that we can get you to it. So not only Head Start, I'm just talking in behalf of um, Karna McCloskey um, here, we have a study plan and we have a, a staff that works with each teacher and teacher assistant and sub that comes in that guides them through the whole process. And, and, and making those connections with the universities and she follows up every six months with their transcripts. What courses are you taking next year? Um, where are you um, in your study plan? Are you achieving? So I think that this is gonna be great um, in the long run for a lot of these families. Remember these children, they're getting two things. They're getting the child care for, 85% of tuition paid for, you know, like Jennifer said, a study plan yeah. and someone that's going to work with you. All right. So, so Malaith, you're a, uh, you're a relatively new refugee service provider, state of Arkansas, um, not in the history of time, if we call it, not a lot of refugees initially sent to Arkansas by state department, the assignment. Um, you know, so what do you see are the sort of the needs of the adults from your work with them? Where have you seen successes? And 
and have you worked with a Head Start program? And you know how how did that go? Yes. Uh, so Arkansas, the refugee program in Arkansas is really new. It just grew this year and last year, and we uh, I think uh, we still continue growing. But it's just started two thousand sixteen, and the first year we just. Uh, 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 will come one family, then uh, after a couple of years, we just start receiving more refugees. So refugee program is already a new move uh, in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, so that's the one of the challenges because people, the system here is not recognized many document or culture or uh, um, the, the, the refugee or even emotion and mental health that the refugee went through. Um, that's when it comes to the us as a caseworker and uh, refugee support and educator when we start teaching other uh, other partners about refugee and their need. Um, with Head Stars, we have really successful uh, successful experience, uh, but at the same time, we have challenges. Uh, this program is really impact, huge impact on people's life, and especially not just emotionally, but it's self-sufficiency because people that came here, there's two important parts. It's the emotion part and also the financial part. When people, they want to start to work after three months, they have to get job and they have to pay the rent and utilities and everything for their family. Three months, it's so short for people to learn the culture, the laws, the language, um, and just uh, integrate in community. So that's the time when we need all the systems and community support to uh, push people, these people for success. Um, um, and that's when uh, it, it start to really play important role by getting people to go to daycares because moms, especially single moms and parents, they can't go to work when they have young kids, they can't go to school. And it's too expensive for people. They just start entering jobs to pay like childcare. And then the comes, we need like put the parent to work until they get pay everything, um, especially the first year of their life in the United States when there's a lot of challenges and barriers. And in the same time, because the programs in Arkansas, we have a lot of challenges when we try to enroll kids in school. Like personally, I have a lot of experience when like Head Start don't understand the document. They don't understand some kids, they don't have birth certificates, but they come with the trouble documents. They don't have a green card because they still yet don't get it because they still they just been here three months or four months yet. So it's a lot of misunderstanding and thus make the the surface is more longer waiting time to get the surface, which impact the family financially because they can't go to work, especially the single moms when or single dads when they can't go to work until the kids like go get daycare and childcare. Also, there is another barrier when comes to language and translating, uh, most of the start here in Arkansas depends on the resettlement agency like Kennedy to provide translation, which is sometimes out of our capacity to provide translation in every, uh, you know, in every places. Uh, even sometimes the hospital call us for tra translating. Um, that's why when I said it's a refugee program, it's new, that's me make all the people like have challenges with language. Some language even we can't find a translator here for specific language and i have one family they already like out immigrate to, to another state because they have challenge even finding translate for them in hospital and school and we try to call people from different state to provide translation so translating also is language barrier it's really important and it's always a huge um another things which is i think most of uh, uh, like uh, Gilda and Jennifer like already mentioned that it's about them understand the culture like when we comes to food you know some people refugee people have a specific diet with the food some people they never understand like try like a canned food before or uh, they don't understand they never tried peanut butter before like I talk about myself and my kids when I arrived here what's peanut butter you know they serve it in school, but I'm not sure how it's taste. I'm not sure if this is 
comes uh, with my uh, religious diet, you know. So it's still a lot of challenges. So if the daycare, like, or the head star staff don't understand specifically the culture for the people, it's going to be really hard to communicate with parent or parents have also hard time to communicate what the child need or what the uh, food appropriate to their culture or their religious. So that's that's really important to understand the culture, understand, you know, the challenges and how much it's, this program is important and impacts uh, people like refugees, families' life. Yeah, I would, I was, you know, number one, I think everybody would agree that life itself is difficult. Yeah. Running a Head Start program is challenging. Running a refugee resettlement agency is challenging. You know, sort of bringing all these things together after a, a traumatic experience of, and change. And, you know, and, and we want to be really clear, uh, none of this is easy. Part of our intent here today, and I'll reinforce this again, is to give you all a starting place and and to also see that you know, people, it can be done. It just, it's a lot of work where the goal here is try to make it a little bit less difficult. And, and one of the things when we did the analysis, the early analysis of, of what we were going to find in the phase of our research, you know, we found background checks, transportation, translation services, cultural awareness. You know, you've heard these things, some common challenges faced mm -hmm. by any of the agencies we've interviewed. We found that Many of the solutions to these problems can be found at the local level when partnering with other organizations that provide some of these services. It's just it's all that you know, creating the the net that that connects the different services at the the community level, and you know, and and Malath, you, you started talking a little bit about this. Talk a little bit more about the ongoing challenges that that you see as. The organization welcoming a refugee family or individual and then just getting them started um, mm -hmm. touched on some yeah. of this but, but it's like that cold hard reality of like i'm smiling i'm this is going to be good and mm -hmm. i can only imagine you know going back to the other what do you think what are they thinking yeah like there's a lot of like one of the biggest challenges now after we get the approved and the child they can join the Head Start, which is it's really achievement for us here in Arkansas <laughs> to get the child go to Head Start and get the approved. But the challenge is the transportation. Like um, Head Start here does not provide any transportation, which is the big challenges for refugees' families. They just arrived to United States. There is already not starting working yet, and they need to child to go to daycares, and it's too hard to figure out the transportation, especially like here in Northwest Arkansas. We already have challenges with public transportation. Buses is not going everywhere, and uh, we don't have any other um, transport, public transportation, just buses. We don't have metros, we don't have any other like accessible uh, access to uh, public transportation, which is make it really harder, which I have like three kids now get a proven head start, but I can't get them to go to head start. It's too mm -hmm. hard to get them to head start because yeah. of the transportation. But, but again, ultimately, Everyone on this call is our panelists. We figured out a way mm -hmm. to address the challenges. It's just, it's just difficult. It's time consuming. Yes. You need the staff to do it, mm -hmm. the connection, the trust. And and so, you know, again, it, it's not, you know, this this team of people on this call, period, they don't give up. I mean, myself mm -hmm. included. Yes. It, it's gotta be a lot of no people before I, you know try to figure out something is, is just, and, and it's not on our list, but it's like, you know, what keeps you going? I yeah, mean, it's, I'm still now so optimistic when I heard like Miss Wilson and Miss uh, Jennifer talking about how much they uh, like moving things and the creative things to make people <laughs> their life easy, you know, <laughs> get the kids go to hit a star. So I'm um, here as Northwest Arkansas, that's what we try to do to advocate and keep connect and build a partnership. That's what we try to do. It's a new thing for Head Start here. 
uh, and for us too in, in Northwest Arkansas, you know, to enroll kids in Head Start. But it's a great program. We rely on it, you know. That's why we try really hard to build this relationship. So we build this trust so they can be more creative and more different to use different tools to get the kids be there. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So so I'm gonna put it out there and then I'm gonna, you know. Gilda, Gilda's going to talk a little bit more about the sort of background checks, some more transportation that seems to be a topic of interest with our, with our audience. But, but I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to lead you right into it, Gilda. It's like, you know, one of the things I was surprised to hear when we were talking with refugee resettlement agencies is we asked if they had worked with Head Start and they said, yes, we tried, but we were told there was a waiting list. So mm -hmm. we sort of gave up. In mm -hmm. working at start, you know, I was devastated at the moment. I'm like, "There's got to be a way." Tell tell us how you know what 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 is possible out there. Being creative community providers, what 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 do you suggest in in that space? I have the answer, but we're gonna so, listen to you. <laughs> I I um I'm gonna touch first about transportation. So okay, the Head Start Act. And um, our performance standards says that any child coming in as a, in a refugee status falls under the McKinney-Vinto Act. The McKinney-Vinto Act um, kind of, it's an act that really uh, is for homeless um, children and families that are categorized. Are they doubling up in a family's home? Are they living in a car? Are they living in a mobile unit? Are they just um, living with a grandmother or relatives in that, in that they are considered homeless? Every district and every school, and I'm, I'm not really sure about the law in Arkansas, but McKinney Ventos for all Head Start programs are required to offer transportation to their children. So first, I'm going to start with the McKinney Vento Act if you're living here in New York, right? Um, you're required, the schools are required, the shelters are required, if they're sitting in a shelter to provide a Metro card um, for those families that are under this category of McKinney-Vento Act, right? So any child that's um, living in a shelter in Brooklyn, out of our borough area, we still can service them because they do, they fall under that McKinney-Vento Act. So that's the transportation here in the city. Um, but by also by law, um, we also have to, when you do your community assessment, you need to put that out there in writing. You need to say, I'm servicing this community and I need transportation. Research has to be done. Numbers have to be done. You need a cost benefit analysis. Um, basically knowing how many children are you gonna service that live 0.5, uh, one mile or more from your um, area. And this is the transportation that we need. So like that when you're doing your applications and your DRS and you're asking for budgeting, you know where your line of budget should come from. So that's just transportation. How do we make it happen? I basically, um, I knew the children were here, right? We knew children were arriving. I would see them walking, selling, um, working with their parents, selling ice cream in the corners. I still see it every day in New York City. I drive, I live in Jersey and I live, I'm a Bronx girl. This is New York. I'm, I grew up in the Bronx. And I see children working and I stop them and I said, do you have a school for your child? No, here's a flyer. I carry our flyers in my hand. But we made a connection with the shelters and we visited the shelters and we did intakes in the shelter. The families were hungry. They said, I called, no one told me that the waiting list. Children that are on the wait list and are considered homeless are automatically eligible. They oversee any child on the wait list. The Head Start program has a selection criteria that those children get enrolled first, anyone. It's not by who came first, who came second. Head Start performance standards says it's by the need of the family. So with that being said, that's where we go. How do we, um, how do you do the community engagement um, for these translation? Then we need to start finding out the consulate office. You need to go to the consulate office and really find out if you could partner with them um, and say, do you have volunteers? Reach out to the colleges. They have all these um, cultural, um, uh, they travel. Um, some of these students are looking for hours to do these, um, you know, their internship hours. That could be um, 
something to connect with. I know we do it here for health. We have a, a, um, a nutritionist that comes in and we could do that also for um, reviewing our records, translating materials. Um, we have the resource, it's just getting them. And it takes a while, like Jennifer said, but um, it's you can we can do it. If we start small, we work big. I love it. Jennifer, some of the, you know, it's like, you mentioned earlier the apprentice program and some of the things, but but you know what what are those sort of the ongoing issues and and you know how how are you how is Family First being successful in this space? Um. Well, our our thing that started out is like funding is always a challenge because mm -hmm. we, when we started out, like I said, we started out and we had COVID funding, which was beautiful because we were able to start out big and have, you know, positions and 40 hour a week positions. And we have the funding to do it and didn't have to worry. And then COVID funded ended. And then it was another barrier because where in your budget do you get extra, extra spots for this? Mm -hmm. um, and so then we had to put our heads back together to figure out like, where are we going to do this? Cause we're going to do this. We're not going to stop. We're going to do this. Um, and so we, you know, we started using some of our training funds because you can use training funds to support parents. And so we, you know, we use training funds. Um, we have scholarship dollars. We are now utilizing childcare assistance funding. So we're using some of that braided funding to be able to do that. We're applying for, some additional grant funding. And so we're just continuing to search to be able to do this. Um, and what we found now is we've had um, parents who've gone through their, they've done their CDAs and become permanent staff people. And those staff people are now doing teach and are working towards their associates and bachelors. And as part of that, they get what is called uh, release time. So they get three hours a week, which they get to work on their, their schoolwork and teach reimburses us for that time. And we're able to use that reimbursement time to help pay for our parents' CDAs. So we're funneling that into paying for our parents' CDAs. So it's sort of this first full circle of, we started out parent CDAs, they've moved into teach, and now we're using teach release time to help pay for our parent CDA float position. So we're, we keep, hopefully, to keep cycling that through in that we way. Find way. We find we a just, way. We just, I'm like, you know, even, you know, even people, even people with the best intentions will put, like, you seem to put barriers where you don't mean to put barriers. And I'm sure we have put barriers somewhere in front of someone that we didn't mean to. Um, but I think if you just continue to, to, to keep focusing on the family, just keep putting that family, like it, our name, families first. We want to always keep thinking that family and how can we help that family get to where they need to get to? Like, you can find a way to remove that barrier if you just just keep working at it. Just don't give up. Great people who work in this country helping other families. Awesome. Dr. Wilson, you've got your hand up. And then we're going to go to Q's and A's. Uh, just real fast. Uh, I, you know, we're always looking for funding, funding, funding. And, uh, you know, uh, this is just another way uh, Cleveland has done it. And we, uh, they have a, the, the actual school district has a, a newcomer school. Mm -hmm. And it's for uh, families who have been only here for less than a year. And the children stay with them for an entire year, including a preschool class that we help to uh, uh, support. Head Start helps to support that class. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about uh, that newcomer school, those kids come in and they have upwards of 102 uh, different languages and they're all in the same class. It's it's an amazing 
uh, process, but we use them uh, because of their uh, just their support in having people who can coach families as well. And when they're coaching these families, they're you know just the simple things that you we 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 take for granted every every day. But sure, we can give you uh, bus tickets and bus passes. But do you know what bus to take? And do you know how to get the yeah? How do you get on a bus? Where to get off? And all that. So uh, the newcomer school helps the families uh, with just just the uh, everyday. Uh, mundane things that we take for granted. All right. Well, I, wow. Um, really appreciate the number one, all the work that is represented by this panel and, and all the families that have been helped and, uh, and uh, have a, you know, better opportunities here in the United States as a result of your work. And I want to go ahead and open it up to the, the audience for some questions. And, and one of the, one of the first questions I see here is about, information on the McKinney-Vento Act. And, and this gives me an opportunity to say, if you go to the materials that were prepared by Forrest Marsh in partnership with the National Head Start Association, you can learn a lot more about the McKinney-Vento Act and how to use it in your community. Um, almost, well, I will say every topic we discuss today is discussed in the materials. I promise you, they are not, it's not a 200 page document that you need to read. It's a, a several page fact sheet in each that, that helps you get started so that, so that you're, you know, again, not starting from, wow, I wonder where to go from here. It, it helps you know where to go to get started, save the, it, it shortens your learning curve, if you will. Um, so anyway, I'm advertising the materials that were developed. Again, they hit on every topic that we've discussed today, and then specifically the one question about McKinney-Vento, there is a detail in there about how to make that work for you and your community. Uh, looking for other questions at this point. And I'm, I'm looking at the chat and and I I don't see any more right now, but a a point I want to make is what happens when a family, a shelter gets moved, moved or moved to another zip code. Um, who wants to help me with that one? The question they, is, what happened? Go ahead. Go, go. <laughs> they qualify because that falls under the McKinney-Vento Act. If a family um, is living in a shelter or gets moved from another shelter, they still qualify for your service. It is your um, determination and you to assist and support the family with transportation in the McKinney-Vento Act, if it's in the city, a metro card, um, to the family. And I want to touch base about that. Most of these uh, programs, we all have family workers. And most of our family workers take the time, like uh, Dr. Wilson was saying, to kind of like print out the directions, highlight you're going to get off on this stop, you're going to go here. And we do it in Spanish. That's what we, that when I started, you, we used to use hop stop. Right. I was a, a home visitor and one of the families didn't know how to get somewhere. And I remember highlighting where you're going to go. So they qualify. But evidence, you know, it, it also affects your attendance. Um, but you can also find out under the Head Start locator where the new zip code, where they're going. And it'll tell you um, by mile, where's the next um, Head Start that they should be transferred um, to. But they still fall onto your category until they have permanent housing. And I'll add in those resource materials, it also has a link to refugee resettlement agency locators. So, you know, a, a key point, if all of you on the, the, the webinar today, go on there, look and find your local refugee resettlement agency, pick up the phone, say hello, introduce yourself and say, I have two goals for this call. One, if you have any children who are eligible to register for Head Start, let's let's help get them registered. And then two, you have a self-serving reason. I want to hire refugees and or individuals from refugee communities into Head Start. Do you have individuals that might be interested? You know, if if that comes out of this whole project for Head Start programs to reach out, make that call, and refugee resettlement agencies to reach out to Head Start programs and say, 
You know, we have a family who just arrived. They have a child who's eligible. I now understand the McKinney Vento Act. You need to enroll them, you know, and, and we get that kid in and start building that relationship. Um, we're out of time. I do want to say, you know, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Forrest Marsh. Thank you for the National Head Start Association for creating this opportunity to do this project. And I really, we welcome your feedback. If there are things we've missed or you, you still have questions, please let us know. I personally feel like you've invested an hour in your time. If you didn't get something answered, please let us know. We will do our best to answer your question or connect you, more likely connect you with somebody who knows what they're talking about uh, to help you work through that. So again, the toolkits are posted. We're gonna post this online on the National Head Start Association website under the hub and uh, resources. And we, we value your feedback and that will help us continue to make this project more relevant to Head Start programs as relevant refugee resettlement agencies. And, and again, I personally, and I'm sure everybody on this call uh, appreciates the time the panelists have, have given to us today. And, and hopefully you all are a little further along the learning curve now as a result of their efforts. So thank everybody. And we'll, we'll end the webinar there. <laughs>